Thank you. Um, and uh, Larry's uh, remarks are actually a perfect segue. Oops, we're going to shift and no, it goes back down the other end. Uh, Larry's, Larry's remarks actually are a perfect segue to, to the session because you know, the, first, the morning was all about what are the evolving and sustainable business models for the industry. And that, in my mind, is the biggest question facing the, the future of the, of the broader telecom, internet, community, industry, businesses. Um, the question for this session, which Larry teed up, is what role, if any, and it's, a, it's an extremely important question, that's why we're here. But the question for this session is what role, if any, does regulation have in the evolution of the business models? And if there's a role for regulation, what role, if any, is there for international regulation? Uh, in the evolution of the business models and the benefits from both telecom and, and the internet. Uh, I've asked the panelists actually to do less speechifying and presentations so we actually have more time for conversation and discussion and questions. And I've already uh, identified at least three people in the audience who want to um, uh, have a comment. Uh, Secretary General Hamid and Torre is supposed to be here in a little over an hour. So we're a little bit constrained on time, so we'll get right with it. You have the bios. I'm not going to in the handout, so I'm not going to introduce anybody. Uh, Roland Dahl from uh, Deutsche Telekom, we'll, and Edna will we'll lead off. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, uh, thanks to CITI and Idata for both organizing this interesting event. Uh, and uh, um, I was warned to come here uh, to this uh, rather hostile environment of the puzzle. <laughs> uh, but uh, I said to myself, well, uh, maybe it's important to, to come and talk and explain a little bit uh, more what the ethno proposal is about, because we feel there's a lot of misrepresentation uh, and false statement about our proposal. So uh, I thought uh, it's important to explain uh, what is the ethanol proposal and what it is not. Before uh, starting, uh, I just uh, 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 want to put it a little bit in a context. Uh, uh, as uh, we learned, the ITU is a very old organization founded in the 19th century already. Uh, and uh, due to the fact that telecommunications has been international by nature, it was felt that you need to have some basic arrangement to make sure that the international flow of, uh, of information uh, works. Uh, so, um, of course, in the past it was uh, about dedicated telephone and telegraph uh, networks, uh, and this was a big change of the ITRs uh, in the negotiations in Melbourne, the Botsy, in 1988. Um, uh, we had, uh, first in time, uh, a technological neutral definition of the scope of the ITRs. And this definition uh, uh, certainly encompass, encompasses all kinds of telecommunications and certainly also IP traffic. Uh, I can go back later on this. Uh, I, I, I thought best thing is basically putting simply the original text on the charts so you can read it. Um, but uh, this is technologically neutral and, of course, already since 1988 includes IP traffic as well. And so we have now the kickoff of the revision of the ITRs in 2011, 1988 to 2011, a very long time. Uh, and in between, the world of telecommunications has changed significantly. Uh, if industry wanted to make a submission, there was a deadline by the ITU. 6th of June this year, uh, and Edna took the opportunity to raise two points uh, which for the European uh, telecommunications operators are seen as very important, and we seized the opportunity to put forward our major concerns in this proposal which was submitted to the ITU. So first of all, because very often when I talk to people, uh, they haven't even seen the original text of our proposal. I thought it's basically good to put it on the chart. 
Uh, just to explain on the basis of the original proposal what is the ethno proposal. And basically, it consists of two parts. One part of the proposal is about the possibility to introduce quality of service, end to end quality of service in the internet. To keep this freedom, basically, it's not a provision which says you have to have it, it's basically keeping the freedom to introduce quality of service apart from the best effort internet. And we feel this is important. Uh, to provide more choice uh, for our customers. Uh, the second part of the proposal is about uh, 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 the apparently most uh, uh, contested uh, part of the proposal on uh, uh, the uh, addressing the problem of the uh, sustainability of the internet in terms of uh, having uh, unbalanced traffics uh, on IP on a global basis and having not yet found a way uh, to uh, cope with these uh, problems uh, on a commercial basis yet, and therefore we felt it may be uh, important to raise uh, a general principle, and it's not more than a general principle, it's not an obligation to follow, to raise a, a general principle which governed international telecommunications for more than 100 years, saying that someone who sends traffic basically has also to bear the cost of this traffic to be terminated. Uh, of course, this is meant to be a default option, only in case you cannot come to an arrangement. And of course, you all know, when we discuss the ITRs, there's also the bold exception, uh, uh, the bold escape clause in Article 9, which always has been there, which always said, and since 1998, uh, and we, we have just heard that most of the international commercial agreements is based on the Article 9 of the ITRs, which says, basically, you can do whatever you want on commercial terms. You do not have to follow these ITR rules. So we feel that this is not really a very restrictive thing you're putting in there. We're just reminding of a principle, which says, basically, this is something you have to respect when you start negotiations on international IP traffic. What is not the Etno proposal? And here, of course, uh, Etno is not proposing at all uh, to not continue the international stakeholder dialogue. But what we are talking here about is has never been part of the international stakeholder dialogue. It's about international peering arrangements. They have never been discussed in the global stakeholder process. It's a mere economic negotiation, basically, between uh, big operators around the world and has never been part of this multi-stakeholder process. So we're doing nothing here, taking something away from this process, which has yet been part of the process. And certainly, we are here in an area of pure economic interest. It's not about internet governance. It's basically a remuneration for services you are providing to other carriers in the world. <laughs> so, we feel it's very important to understand that the Edna proposal is not about internet governance, it's not about content, it's about really technical telecommunications, how to manage technical telecommunications, set up some general principles which govern technicalities and uh, the question of uh, um, charging for these services on a global basis. Very often it's pretended that Edno proposes amendments as called for extending the ITRs beyond traditional telcos. And when you look at our proposal, that's not true. Of course, what we did basically is we substituted administration for operating agencies. And this is basically following the proposal the European states made in the context of the revision of the ITRs, modernizing these ITRs because at least in our countries, you do not have any longer have administration. Since liberalization, there are private companies running the business, there are no administrations uh, uh, which can be addressed by this international treaty, though they were, they were proposing to substitute this by operating agency, which just took on the language, the more modern language in our proposal, without having in mind to extend the scope to companies who are not in the business of providing international telecommunication services. But if, if, for instance, an over-top player goes into this business, of course he has to respect the same rules. 
because we're going to divide between those who historically have been in the telecom business and those who are coming in the telecom business and have different rules to follow. It depends simply on what your business is, whether you have to respect these rules or not. Suddenly we are not introducing any taxes. It's simply a fee which has to be paid for a service you're delivering. And uh, looking at the sustainability question we have touched upon several times today, my feeling uh, uh, was that uh, the system, the international system, is not, not really sustainable and stable in a way. So it's a precarious system of peering arrangements and very often you find the small operators or the small countries have to pay to the big ones. Uh, and the problem is a bit that they do not have the negotiation power on a global scale to deal in a correct way which allows them to be also treated the same way. We do, we do not even have a system of, of uh, um, uh, bill and keep in the area. Basically, normally small operators have to pay the big operators to be connected to the internet, which is not related to the cost they have in providing and delivering the traffic to their customers. I haven't understood why developing countries could be cut off, because certainly all depends on the negotiations between the operators, local operators, and the other operators globally. So there is no need that there should be someone cut off of the internet. To the contrary, uh, it could be that these operators in developing countries can find uh, a fair compensation for the services which allow them uh, to develop their national networks further. And it certainly would not undermine the way the internet is working so far. As I already said, it's a basic principle, but it's not an obligation to follow. And it's simply meant to remind us about the basic principle of someone who's great, who's, who's, uh, um, who's, who's uh, opposing costs of someone to someone else has to compensate for this. Very often we hear the argument that the ethno proposal is extending the scope of the ITRs to the internet. Uh, and I would emphasize again that we are not talking about the internet here. For us it's very important that we are talking about IP traffic which is something other than the internet itself. Uh, this is a technical means of transportation we are using. And as I said, and you can read here, on the next slide, the definitions of the ITRs as they stand today. These are defined, telecommunications are defined as any transmission, emission, or reception of signs, signals, writing, images, and sounds, or intelligence of any nature by wire, radio, optical, or other electromagnetic need systems. This means this, of course, includes all kinds of IP traffic as well. This is also true for the definition of the International Telecommunications Services, which means the offering of a telecommunications capability between telecommunications office or stations of any nature that are or belong to different countries. So here again, we do not extend the scope beyond what is already in the ITRs. The only thing we are doing... Oh, that reminds me that 10 minutes are over. Um, the only thing we are asking for is basically keeping the system open for quality of service, maybe <laughs> helping to establish an end-to-end -end quality of service system on a global basis, because you, cannot, you can only provide quality of services in the internet if you can make sure that the quality is available across borders and across networks. That's the one point. And the other point is we want to make sure that in negotiations of such arrangements of traffic in the international world that at least the one who is creating a lot of traffic should have an incentive to use the network in an efficient and economic way or otherwise come up with some compensation payment for the usage of the networks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland. Uh, David Gross is, uh, many of you know, is a former U.S. Ambassador for Communications. Um, one of the things it says in there that David does now is advise companies on a range of issues. Um, for the purpose of this discussion, 
David actually is representing a coalition of uh, U.S. tech companies, carriers, content companies uh, on the broad range of issues uh, that are being raised within the wicket at the IT. David. Thank you very much, Bob. I appreciate uh, the honor of being here and being with a lot of friends and colleagues. Uh, if you don't mind, I, I always like to start uh, when I'm back here at Columbia with a personal note. Uh, my father was a professor here for about 30 years, so it's always wonderful to be invited back and a friend, an old friend of Ellie Gnomes and so forth. He was, and dean. He was dean of the engineering school here for, for many, many years and so forth. So people's budgets, like Ellie's, was uh, affected by these things. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I, I, I speak here impartially in his honor now that he is uh, retired. Uh, I thought that rather than uh, sort of go in a point by point uh, rebuttal to Rollins' excellent, excellent presentation, uh, I, I thought I would just make a couple of points and then look ahead rather than to try to relitigate uh, the positions that I think have been very well stated now for, for many months. Uh, I will note uh, that uh, despite Rollins' excellent uh, summary and, and views, uh, we are talking about the International Telecommunications Regulation. As uh, Assistant Secretary Strickling talked about, uh, these is a treaty. We will be making in December international law. That law will be regulatory. It is the International Telecommunications Regulation. It will affect if proposals such as the ETNO proposal and others clearly affect the internet. It is designed to affect internet traffic. That's why we're having the discussion and that's why ETNO believes that this conversation is so important. De redefining and changing definitions of what is internet governance to be this, that, or the other thing is not, I believe, a helpful process in terms of understanding what the core concepts are. Uh, <coughs> Related to that is a fundamental issue that was raised earlier today that in essence is a question of sovereignty. The International Telecommunications Regulations and International Treaty takes the place of and sets the, uh, the parameters for things other than domestic policy. Along those lines, the question really is why is there a need for this action? It is well understood that remarkably close to 100% of the peering relationships are done on a basis of non-regulatory intervention, that is basically with a handshake and other exchange of traffic. Uh, Roland talked a bit about the quality of service issue, but then also talked about the quality of service being needed because we're talking about the internet. So the concept about it being not the internet or the internet, I think is a distinction without a difference. The issue, I think, in terms of the sovereignty is particularly important. It's important in a number of respects, but let me just talk about two of those. One is we heard from uh, Stephen Conroy earlier today about Australia's uh, experiment and how it will be putting out its, uh, developing its broadband uh, system. Uh, we're honored here by having uh, the head of uh, ICT Qatar. Qatar is also going in a direction of having intervention in the, in the uh, production and uh, dissemination of internet uh, facilities. Here in the United States, a different approach was taken, one in which we've looked to the private sector to build out literally at trillions of dollars the system here in the United States. Europe has a system, Japan has a system. Each country, reflecting its unique circumstances, its history, its relationships, has chosen to go forward in a particular way. I would suggest that it is very dangerous to everyone that international rules governing the economics of the internet be established on a one-size-fits-all, even if it allows for some differentiation, but ultimately those requirements would have to find some kind of common ground. If not, then the words of the treaty are without meaning. That would be a tremendous problem for everyone. The fights would be good for lawyers, but for no one else. The issue of how this works is particularly important. Traditionally, the ITU is an organization of great importance, as has been talked about a number of times today. It does extraordinary things. It has helped to make the world 
a much more connected place, a place which has really transformed literally hundreds of millions, if not billions of people's lives around the world. But it has been able to do that in a non, uh, in a way that does not require governments to act. Rather, it is a source of exchange of information, and only in certain areas such as spectrum are there internationally binding rules. And even in that situation, even with regard to spectrum, those international binding rules do not have an enforcement mechanism to it. The proposals put forward by many countries and by other organizations, including Edna, presuppose that there must be some type of enforcement mechanism. Because without that enforcement mechanism, then in fact what we're talking about has no value, has no purpose. And so that would be a radical core change to the role of the ITU, to the role of the relationship between member states and international organization, as well as amongst countries by taking that path. It would seem more than passing strange to me that where that path would be taken would be of all the places one of the extraordinary, unprecedented in human history situations, the internet, which has brought so much values, changed so much, has brought such benefits to people who never before thought they would ever have the benefits of technology, and done so in a way that is basically without governmental regulation, and certainly without intergovernmental regulation. That would be, if nothing else, an extraordinary, and I fear, dangerous precedent for all of us to take. It could, in my view, substantially change the relationships, and in so doing, destroy that which probably has been the greatest hallmark of what has brought uh, us together over the past few years. I would also say, in my view, I'm old enough now, uh, I get to say, having been involved in these issues, related issues, for over 30 years, that I'm humbled by what I've learned over that time. And one of the primary things I've learned is that nobody, nobody's forecast of the future is consistently correct. Back in the very early 1980s, I was very involved in the licensing of mobile services here in the United States, 1984 and the like. And all of our regulations were based upon the premise that mobile services would at best only affect five, four, five, maybe six percent of the U.S. population. And no one thought that it would have a major impact on the developing world. It was just going to be the U.S., Canada, Europe, Japan, and a handful of other countries. <coughs> Nobody predicted it. The founders of it, the technicians, the policymakers, no one thought this was going to happen. And today we have over six billion connections. You can go through virtually every single major transformation over the last 30 years. Social networking, the rise of the internet itself, and realize that nobody <coughs> predicted it. In fact, the only thing that things that people have predicted, in fact, are the usual problems. I think the problem of sustainability that people have talked about of the internet is an extraordinarily important topic. But it is not a new topic. It has been a topic that has been discussed since my father was here at Columbia and he got connected to the internet when it was just by government contractors and the like. And people said the problem was too many people were getting on, it's going to crash. <laughs> so these problems are old problems, they are not new problems but they demand new thinking. My suggestion would be to recognize the importance of the issues that Etno and others have raised in this area, and suggest that probably it is not the right place to go to the ITU, an intergovernmental regulatory agency, but rather to do so in a broader fashion, through commissions and through multi-stakeholder processes, which allow direct participation by all interested parties to discuss these, to inform, and to advise governments around the world, as well as industry participants, as to what the opportunities are, what the potentials are, and what the potential solutions are. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, presenter is Len Cowley from uh, AT&T. 
Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I thought I would start with a simple question. And the question really is, which of these? And, and you should laugh at that because the answer is obvious, right? Which of these is going to provide greater connectivity, greater productivity? Which of these is going to carry us into the future? Um, but what I wanted to make the point is that question should also apply to the regulatory framework. Which of these should define the regulatory framework for the internet going forward? Um, today, we live in a world where we still have a regulatory framework that was developed in the last century for the voice telephone monopoly. Well, that monopoly is gone, and I want to share with you just a piece of data from the state's AT&T servers. This is the voice telephone monopoly, that blue line, actually these bars. The, today, less than 30% of households are connected to, to, to traditional telephone service. Less than 30%. Most people get voice service from a cell phone, a cable company, over the top of the OIP, and the 30% that are connected, virtually all of those people have the same options. So why am I telling you this? Well, instead of having a panel that they, on the agenda says it's about expanding rules beyond networks to apps and, and other ICT, we should be asking whether, whether we need rules and what rules we need. I'm not here advocating this is a world of no regulation, but I am saying we're starting from the wrong premise with the agenda. And why? That's because this is what we have today. We have a complex and constantly evolving ecosystem. Um, what's amazing about this ecosystem is it sprang up not despite the lack of regulation, but because of it. This ecosystem is competitive, consumer focused, and private sector driven. And it grew up with a decentralized and flexible architecture, as well as the decentralized and flexible governance model. So my point would be, let's take what works and sustain it, not change it. Let's start from the premise, and just the premise of no regulation, decide what policy objectives we have, and then from the ground up determine what is needed to achieve these objectives and through what components of this ecosystem. You know, we, we could spend all day going through potential policy objectives, and it's clear, if there are privacy interests you're concerned about, you really don't protect those just by regulating the networks. If you're concerned about public safety and you want to text to 911, and we're kidding ourselves, if we think imposing a text to 911 obligation on the networks is going to achieve that when so many customers are moving to over the top texting apps. So it's not, the list goes on, and my point isn't that we need a host of regulations, but my point is we do have to think different. We need new thinking to understand how our policy objectives can be achieved in this scenario. And then we get to the hows and the wheres, which include the ITRs. Do we continue the same frameworks that developed for the old monopoly utilities? Or do we embrace new models that have been so successful in advancing the growth of the internet today? Right now, we have well-accepted and efficient rules of the road that have been developed in the context of voluntary multi-stakeholder groups, allowing business arrangements to be based on commercial considerations. The results have been nothing short of astounding. We talk about that, and then this morning we heard some projections that sounded bleak, or at times may have been bleak. But I'm here to say the model's working. Um, it's too early to, to pull the plug on the competitive market. We haven't give up, given up. We've heard a couple of times today about the amount of private investment in the US, well over a trillion dollars over the last 15 years in broadband networks. And all the trends show that investment is spreading across the globe in backbone into exchange point facilities, bandwidth access facilities, and so-called over-the-top offerings. The growth poses challenges for everyone. We don't deny that. But a flexible commercial approach to these challenges is the best way to meet them. I, mean, I think David said, well, no one knows the future. No one knows what are the right business models going forward in this dynamic and complex an industry. But what we believe is the commercial flexibility that got us here is going to drive the internet forward. And this is why AT&T does not agree with the Ethno proposal. Its efforts to address internet compensation frameworks in the ITRs, in our view, dramatically changes the view of government's proper role with respect to the internet. It's not that the model that no proposes is bad or is bad in all circumstances. I don't know. Rather, it's that mandating the proposal in ITRs is wrong, and we view it as an invitation to increase intervention and regulation of the ecosystem. I recognize that there are sustainability concerns, investment concerns. In fact, the ITU reports highlight a host of concerns related to access, price, bandwidth, quality, skills, relevant content, languages, and applications, and the like. Uh, but these can't be fixed by introducing a regulatory compensation model in the ITRs. That threatens to slow growth and investment, not improve it. 
I realize that the Secretary General will speak to us shortly, and I look forward to what he'll say. He has done very important things at an agency that is essential to the operation of the industry. The ITU's work with respect to spectrum, standards, and development is and will remain critical, as a, and its service as a venue, as we were discussing earlier, for discussion, collaboration, and consensus will continue, continue to serve the global community well. But the ITR should not be adapted to apply to the internet and any component of the internet. It is unnecessary and could impose a layer, or would impose a layer, of international regulations that would ha that prove harmful to continued development of the internet. So I close just by reiterating that I think the, the commercial arrangements that gave rise to the smartphones and the internet remain the right framework for the 21st century. Thank you. So we now actually have a, a, a real content provider, uh, Chris Libertelli from uh, Netflix. Um, and you know, Chris is, I think, going to have a slightly different perspective. Um, but I'm trying to think, was there any other pure content provider that's actually spoken today? I don't think so. So you know, Chris, there's a burden on you to represent the content community. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bob. And thanks to Bob and Ellie for including me in this discussion. I really, I always learn a lot when I come up to City, and uh, very pleased to be here. Um, I wanted to speak very briefly today and move quickly through these slides. There's a part of this that's a bit of an advertisement for Netflix, so I'm sure you can just find it afterwards. Um, and do three things. Say a word or two about Netflix as a content provider. Um, identify an issue that uh, we'll call uh, the gatekeeper issue and the threat to internet openness. And then finally, talk about the correct, some assumptions for the correct policy environment for what I call long tail new entrants into the over the top video business. Um, this story is probably very familiar to you. Netflix started with these little red envelopes and then moved quickly into, in 2012, into the streaming business, which allows us to address a global market for the distribution of content uh, with a deep content library and with. Uh, device ubiquity. This is a principle that many of us in this room have worked on called Carter Phone. Well, the same is true for uh, mobile phone networks, and it allows uh, entities like Netflix to embed their software on devices, which allow people to view television shows and movies when they're on the go. Uh, and it's a principle upon which we base a lot of our advocacy. The backdrop for the policy environment here is a shift in the industry from the first era of broadcasting, which is defined by an analog uh, television set and very few choices to the middle phase, which is where we're in now, perhaps right on the edge of a third phase, where we have a linear programming grid uh, digital cable offered by an MVPD and a, an explosion of cable networks. The third phase we describe as one characterized by millions of choices where applications are competing against each other. So we have a situation where HBO Go and Netflix are uh, competing against each other for the user experience and consumers are choosing over-the-top apps or, in fact, MVPD services as a complement to those MVPD services. And, of course, when you move these uh, services into the software, higher layers of the stack, you have the possibility of providing that service across all screens. This was, I think it was Simon this morning mentioned that there was a general decrease or a, a yeah, decrease in MVPD subscriptions, and this is a chart that shows Netflix's uh, growth up and to the right. And you can see there, right underneath the 25 million number, Comcast subscriptions gently falling left to right. Uh, HBO, for example, also gently falling left to the right. But one thing to watch over the next year or two is that HBO in the Nordics, for example, has untethered their application, HBO Go, from the underlying MVPD service. And so it'll be interesting to see whether that line reverses for them once they pull out of an authenticated model where you have to be a cable subscriber to also use HBO Go. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it will take too long and it's probably something that folks know. This is a quick discussion of all the different windows that are characteristic of the kind of content market that over-the-top video providers must deal with if they're buying content from uh, particularly Hollywood. Except to notice that uh, one of the big trends that we see in the over-top video market is that there's a lot of complementarity between Netflix and the underlying MVPD subscriptions or their, their cable channels. And one of the best examples was, I think, Larry, you mentioned that you're doing some catch-up viewing of television programs. Well, a lot of people were doing catch-up viewing of Mad Men, and then we delivered uh, some of that audience back to AMC for the season five premiere. Uh, 
which is a good thing, good for Netflix, as well as good for AMC. This is the other point that I want to make in this one section, is that increasingly, you are seeing over-the-top video providers invest in their own independent content. So for us, the two marquee brands that we're going to be talking about are in the lower left-hand corner, a remake of the BBC's House of Cards, and in the upper left-hand corner, uh, Arrested Development, which is a show that was aired on Fox a few years ago that we will resurrect next year. I want to talk a little bit about, in the context of this Edmo proposal, a micro example of some of the things that we are worried about. And it has to do with three kinds of discrimination. The first is wholesale discrimination, where we are concerned that ISPs will discriminate in the kind of interconnection they offer to entities like Netflix. Let's say, just pause for a moment on that. Um, Netflix is building its own content delivery network. I think some of the other over-the-top providers also have content delivery networks. And in order to scale these networks, you have to interconnect them with the local access networks of the broadband providers. So we're not talking here about transit and peering. That's happening in the core of the network. We're talking about something that's a very localized, almost at the head end, where Netflix will offer for free to co-locate cache servers in the uh, network, inside the network boundary of the ISP, which allows us to get our content closer to the user, higher, better experience for the user, but importantly, and this is the key point, avoids the ISP going off onto the internet and incurring the cost of fetching Netflix content when one of their consumers wants to pull down a movie or a TV show. And here, we've had uh, great success um, interconnecting that content delivery network, which we call Open Connect, abroad, but less so in the US, and the question is, why is that? And is it a cause for regulatory concern? And we would say yes, it is. The second um, example is a retail kind of discrimination where ISPs discriminate over the last mile consumer connection. Uh, and I'll have a slide after this to show you what I mean by that. And the third is something that's much more subtle, but worth talking about. Because over the last year or so, we've seen broadband caps and usage-based <coughs> billing migrate from the wireless network to the fixed line network. And that was somewhat surprising to us because cost recovery is generally happening on the fixed line network. It's not an issue of, uh, for example, Comcast providing an internet service that's below cost. But instead, what we're seeing are subtle moves to perhaps create in consumers an anxiety around using the internet too much. right? And what we have here are situations where there are broadband caps in place and then significant overage charges for consumer that goes above those caps. This is the example that I like to use because it's a concrete one. Um, the three scenarios I'm talking about here are the exact same content being delivered in three different ways. So the top line is your typical linear program, right? Game of Thrones, you fire up your, your remote control and you walk it off, watch it off your set top box and those bits were delivered by the access network and didn't count against your broadband cap. Move to uh, the Xbox, which is uh, a gaming platform where Comcast has built a special application in Xfinity on the Xbox. And here, uh, that same content delivered to that Xbox is not counted against the internet cap. But if that consumer were to move one icon over and choose Netflix to watch the exact same content, you'd see those bits charged against the cap. That's an example of potentially unlevel playing field that uh, is cause for regulatory concern and should be something that regulators remain vigilant around. So to move towards the uh, international realm and the Edno proposal, I'll say I spent seven years working on these issues at Skype. And um, the, the interesting thing that I've found since I've moved to Netflix is that th there is no consensus that the government should, as I said here, uh, put their thumb on the scales in favor of increased consumer choice. There's no political consensus that we need to have some robust policy environment to enable new entrants to gain access to customers to scale, as they did, for example, when the satellite industry started. And this is a cause for concern, because in order to compare any given regulatory actions, whether it's the right answer or not, I think we need to have a North Star to know what the policy environment should look like. What does success look like? And for us, success looks like what I call a multimodal competition environment. And that means that access providers should have a chance to succeed, as well as application providers, right? When I was in government at the FCC, the goal was, under Michael Powell, intermodal competition, right? 
The idea is we'd have a, a, a brief transition period of intramodal competition, but that would fall away over time. Regulations would be scaled back, and you'd have robust intramodal competition. Well, I don't think it's controversial to say that, at least in the US, we have the amount of intramodal competition we're going to have. And it isn't what people expected in the 96 Act. In most parts of this country, you have um, either one or two broadband providers. And for us, all of our arguments rest on the following sort of reality, which is that for residential ISP connections, there is a terminating access monopoly. There is only one way for Netflix to get to that consumer. And because there's no competition in that part of the network, there's no way other providers can set the price. That's an invitation to regulation, particularly where you have uh, a denial of interconnection that I mentioned up front. Um, one of the other arguments that we are trying to make across the board to regulators in Canada, right now in Brazil, and the United States, is you'd be surprised at how often I get into arguments with regulators about whether Netflix is a broadcaster, or Netflix meets the Brazilian definition of a broadcaster. And I think that's a, that's a real mistake. We should try to build this policy environment from the ground up and figure out what are those definitions designed to protect? What, what problem are we trying to solve? And I think, Len, you said it exactly right. I mean, you, you sound like we sound when we go to talk to regulators, which is to say, if you have a concern about the creation of domestic content in Canada, for example, you should look to whether over-the-top the, over providers are actually supporting your domestic content goals by allowing domestic content providers to reach foreign audiences and vice versa. So instead of a reflexive application of legacy rules, our view is that those rules should be a product of foresight and judgment based on current market conditions and a very precise understanding of what problem regulation is designed to solve. So I'll leave it there, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have afterwards. Thank you. So we're now, we're now going to have a domestic regulator. Um, Carlos Rula Guterres is the telecoms regulator in uh, Costa Rica. Um, he also, uh, we were joking the other day, uh, has actually sat through um, uh, working council meetings in preparation for the Wicked for days on end in Geneva. Um, he sat through three of those, I <laughs> sat through one. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to be spending more time together at uh, some of the meetings. Thank you. So, uh, the moment the Secretary General comes in, I will finish. I guess that was the message. So, I have to make it really short. Not necessary, we're tracking him down. <laughs> so, the, the, the disclaimer for Costa Rica is that uh, our telecom law is rather new. It's based on a free trade agreement with the United States, and it has a clear rule that we should regulate telecommunications. We should not regulate information services the way we spell it. So we cannot move from there. And to prove it, we, we had to do a referendum about this law, and the referendum was positive. So Costa Rican 52% think that's the way to do it. What I think is part of the problem that we are discussing here is, is this vision of the value chain. Because value chain is very, very close to a, to a food chain. And I think in the internet, we, we don't have this linear situation. We, to have an internet service platform, we need three parts. And if we don't have these three parts, then it won't work. And when I look at these three parts, I, I think all of them are putting money on the table for that. If a user is using internet, he, he needs to pay access, unless he's sitting in, in, in Starbucks, but then Starbucks will be paying for, for his access. Um, and, and the service providers like Netflix, they want $7.50 in Costa Rica for a monthly fee. I don't know if that's the same fee you have in, in the US, but it's is new and they are paying for, for the network operators to keep their their servers, etc. So if everybody is paying, uh, probably um, the problem is how to share this money and not, not one single part of it. And if the ITRs don't cover these three parts, then we are in trouble. So I want to make three comments in terms of, of of the internet from the point of view of the small countries and, and then mention if, 
if the ITRs might solve them or not. Uh, in terms of, of broadband, this is, uh, I will limit myself to, to the last point, is that uh, our countries uh, are off the major traffic roads of the internet. Uh, many of the handshakes that have been mentioned here happened offshore, in our point of view, from our point of view, and that the cost of internet access in our countries is much more expensive, particularly if you look in the terms of income. So this is, this is a problem that we have, and, and we always look for places where, where to solve it. The second problem is um, that the internet it was not designed to be a safe communication model, although it was designed for the army, I don't know what went wrong there. And uh, that there is no single phone number, there is no 9, 100, 111 to, to call for security problems. I mean, two weeks ago we had a problem in Costa Rica in the internet and everybody was calling us and, and we didn't know what happened at EPN. By 5 p.m. we found out that GoDaddy was down. <laughs> it happens that all our uh, main addresses of Costa Rica are in GoDaddy, so it was not a cyber security attack. So this is an issue that, that from the point of view of the small countries is, is very important to solve. And uh, then there is the third point uh, about how to go about the internet. And uh, I'm not 100%, I don't agree 100% with the, with the way you put it, Mr. Ambassador, that is uh, a thing of sovereignty. Uh, the fact that the traffic uh, doesn't go between the countries is, is not a problem, but uh, the problem I see is that the governments, uh, our governments at least, small country governments, they are too focused on the network operators only, not even the content operators, and they are not focused on the users. So, um, I think before a small country can go to, to Dubai, and both, they should have a clear idea what they what they want from the internet. And uh, multi-stakeholderism works very well at the international level. It, it's very clear and so on, but it doesn't replace the need for local policies, local broadband policies, local local development policies, and so on. So I don't trust uh, a government that hasn't done its homework to go to those things. So what can we do? Um, the OTTs, which is the title of the whole meeting, it, it needs the tele, telecom infrastructure, but I don't think they are competing. Um, and Dr. Kurt said it, there are ways to, to cooperate and, and, and make it even better as long as they don't collude. So I think we need to, 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 to give each one a hat, but they need to be in the equation. If they're not in the equation, and I don't mean in the IDRs, but if they're not both present, then we don't have internet. So we need a, a, a framework, and I think uh, from my point of view as an economist, that's where economists have faith latently. They have not produced a, a, a model where we have the three pieces together and we can discuss it. And um, the particular problem of these ITRs or meetings uh, is um, we cannot keep the discussion separate. We cannot say we have an administrator, we have a regulator only for telecom, and then we have a national administrator for Spectrum and ICANN, and we have a state department that does the negotiation. It's it's very very difficult to keep the things apart in in, in small government. And that's why I think small countries have big expectation about the ITRs, even if they go unfulfilled, because they need one place where they can discuss all these issues, and there is not one place. But personally, the, the, the experience that Robert just mentioned in Geneva has been very fruitful to, to meet the position of other southern countries, and I have personally higher expectations on the meeting next uh, May, I think, at the ITU level on, on internet policy, because there we have already very interesting proposals of how multi-stakeholder models look at the national level, particularly the case of Brazil. Brazil has already 
present a it's comprehensive way of dealing with internet policy. It's hard to replicate, it's complex, it's expensive, but at least this is what I think is, is the way forward. No, but it was not Mr. Touré. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, I think I have covered all my points in short time, so I'd rather give it for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, so there were several people, as I mentioned, that um, uh, had some comments. That uh, there's Mark Cooper and uh, Sally Wentworth and, and, and Dave Farber. This is really hard, but I think there's a way to show up. I think it's a significant tension, and this is the way I've always looked at it as a, as a consumer advocate. When I ask Netflix to send me a movie, who's the cost cause? I've always believed that I'm the cost cause. The problem with the Edno proposal is that they don't want to charge me. So they see the guy with the deep pockets and say, Let, let's charge him and let him take the heat because I can't set access charges to cover the infrastructure costs of my telecommunications network. Now, it's, it's a neat way to do it, and we've historically done it, but it doesn't work so well anymore. And for many of the developed nations, I don't think that's a legitimate way to solve the problem. But for the rest of the world, we have a real serious problem, an economic problem, and we have to go beyond economics. So all day we heard about this incredibly successful space. In point of fact, the public switch telephone network in the 20th century was a complete disaster for 80% of the people on the planet. We never got them wireline telephone service. We failed. For 84% uh, of the people on the planet, we have failed with broadband. So the vast majority of the people on this planet have been left behind. And they're not happy. And that's your problem in the international space. Ironically, wireless, we've had a miracle, and they call it the mobile miracle, in voice. Over 70% of those people, most of whom never got served by wireline, have mobile voice. They don't want to regulate the internet, they want to participate in the broadband internet. And so my question is, the economics probably won't get those networks to them on a time frame they want. That is unacceptable. What are we going to do about it in the international space? Thanks, Mark. So while well, Mark is handing the microphone to, to Sally, I think he makes a, a good point and raises a, a question. Uh, we can come back to it to the other uh, questions. Uh, the, you know, Roland talked about the uh, traditional model that's based upon some of the notion of cost causation. I originate a call and call you. Um, my network pays your network because of I'm the cost causer, but in the situation that Mark just described, somebody on your network is asking for content that sits on my network, and then I send it to you, question, who's the cost causer? Um, so that actually is a really interesting flip of what we had had this notion about cost causation. Um, Sally? Did you want an answer? Yeah. Well, no, no. Yeah, but I'll, I'll, just go, I'll like to just go to the three interventions, then come back to the panel uh, so that we can then have, have the conversation. Uh, thanks, Bob. This is Sally Wentworth. I'll keep it brief because I too would like to hear the answer to that question. Uh, I'm here from the Internet Society. I think many of you know who we are. I just want to first thank uh, City for this event. Um, we're sponsoring the webcast and hope that many of our chapters around the world are, are watching. I think it's been a fascinating debate today, and one um, perhaps more substantive than, than others I've heard on the, on the topic, and really reveals, at least to me, um, the dynamic nature of the industry, the dynamism of the technology, the standards that are being developed to support it, um, and the user expectations that go along with that. Um, and so as somebody who talked about this virtuous uh, cycle, I think that that was really evident today. I was really happy to hear um, Carlos's point because part of what we didn't hear as much of today is um, the development and the evolution of the business models, particularly in developing countries, uh, which quite honestly is where the growth markets are. 
in many cases. And so I think that playing into this whole discussion about the ITRs, uh, as Carlos pointed out, is a very um, strong hunger by uh, developing countries to have more of this internet. Um, and that is a good thing. Uh, we uh, at the Internet Society disagree that the ITRs are the way to achieve that, but we don't disagree with that as, as the noble goal that we're all pursuing. Um, one of the things that I think troubles us, particularly about uh, the Aetna proposal, is the fact that it is untested, that um, the specificity of the proposal has not been fully evaluated. This is one of the few um, conversations like this that's been truly open, and, um, and I think more of that needs to happen if there, we do have an issue of over the top um, and, and the, the business model, I think that's a conversation that needs to happen. But one of the things about the internet, um, one of my colleagues wrote this paper on the internet invariance, is that um, the internet doesn't have permanent favorites. That um, business models change, successes come, successes go, new ideas come to the fore. And what we um, find of concern um, with some of the proposals coming forward to the wicket is um, the tendency to lock in a particular approach a tendency to lock in a particular um, part of the industry uh, in ways that we think would have um, bad effects globally um, and could really harm the ability of um, these models to evolve and be dynamic in the way that we heard today. Thank you so much. Dave. Yo. And then we'll get back to the panel. We'll start with Roland for some uh, First, uh, as everybody's comment, I've found today so far to be a wonderful experience. One of the few panels, panel uh, talks I've been at where I felt I've gotten something out of it, as opposed to talking heads. Congratulations. Uh, I've been around the internet uh, since it started. In fact, many of my students were the fathers of the internet. I remember Vince Surge when he was a student trying to remember what he was wearing at best then. <laughs> One thing that the internet has been uh, uh, important uh, feature of the internet is continuous evolution. Nobody ever predicted where it was going, or for that matter, even in short-term hindsight, understood how it got there. Many of the things which we now believe were cast in stone, like the peering relationships, well, a conversation between Bob Kahn and I when we were trying to get two government networks to talk to each other and realized that neither one of us could transfer money to each other, so we just said, okay, boys, we'll establish this relationship with no equal traffic in both directions and let's forget about it. And that evolved into a much more complicated space, and yet it worked. It worked remarkably well, uh, considering uh, how far fast it's grown. I think the most important thing to, to realize is that we've created models for the internet as it is now. The last 25 years has been hysterical. I would predict that the next, 50, next 10 years is going to be more hysterical as both the underlying technology changes, the things we use to interact with the internet are going to dramatically change and maybe our fundamental protocols will change. Because as the technology evolves and speed evolves, what we have now runs into trouble. We're beginning to see that already. That means that our technical structure will change. Any regulations, any processes we put in place now have better be rapidly evol evolvable. That's a, I'm not sure that's a word, but it sounds good. Otherwise, we will stop progress. And progress has always been very important in this field. I would have to guess that if we came back in 10 years, nobody would recognize what the internet is now as compared to what it will be then. Um, we have some time before the Secretary General uh, joins us. So, Roland, do you want to start? Yeah, I think these microphones are for the people online. This microphone is for the room, so we'll just use both. That, that, I think works. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yes, uh, um, I think I think uh, all the questions uh, are running around the question of uh, how uh, uh, we 
we keep to be able to finance the, the, uh, the uh, infrastructure investment of the future. And uh, yes, uh, this is uh, in particular a problem for the developing world, but also for countries like Germany, it's not obvious uh, where you get the money from uh, uh, to roll out these high-speed broadband networks. Even so, we believe that uh, there will be a future demand uh, for these uh, networks. Uh, it's a risky business case. and. Uh, here, uh, we believe we are not in a uh, utility business <laughs> because uh, um, uh, we have a lot of uncertainties uh, in this business. Uh, and the problem is uh, the preparedness to pay much more for higher speeds is not there at this point in time because maybe the applications are not there. But if the demand comes up, we do not have to, t have, to have the time to roll out the networks. Having seen that it takes uh, uh, 15 to 20 years to roll out a nationwide network like this is a major exercise. Uh, and we have heard, learned today that in uh, Australia, for 30 million households, it's uh, something like 10 years. Uh, when we look at Germany, uh, we're talking about 40 million households, and we calculated somewhat around uh, more than 20 years for an FTTH uh, network in Germany. So you cannot start building this network when the demand comes up. So you have to make some kind of prognosis of the future demand, and then you're taking the risk. Um, going back to the question of the sustainable internet model, uh, the question is whether you want to charge everything to your consumers, to one the one that they access, or whether you're able also to take a part of the costs from those who are also benefiting from these networks. And uh, I do not talk about uh, those who use the internet and do not make any profits from it, etc. But there are huge companies there which are making a lot of profit from this. Uh, uh, and basically their business model is built on uh, the distribution network they can use. Uh, because without distribution network there would be no business model. So why, why should those not also be uh, 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 liable in, in at least taking part? Uh, it's also in their interest uh, that uh, uh, the networks are upgraded and they take part of the costs of rolling out these networks. On the cost causation issue, uh, which you wanted me to, to respond to, yes, uh, uh, there is a difference between the traditional telephone business, basically, where you make a call and then have a control on, 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 on making causing costs, basically. But on the other side, if someone uh, downloads a movie or, or surfs in the internet, basically the customer himself also has no control on the amount of traffic he is downloading. And uh, uh, this system also does not lead to a situation where the other side of the market, those who are entertaining the servers and providing the content, have an incentive to use this resource uh, as efficient as they can because simply they don't pay for it. So if you do not pay for a resource, basically there's no incentive to use it in an effective way. So probably we need to find models uh, which involve both sides of the markets to have it a sustainable model. So that's my answer to, to this question. Thank you, um, I, uh, Chris uh, wanted to, and then Chris and Len on. Uh, yeah. I wanted to, so a few thoughts on the EDNA proposal, and I, I, I appreciate your explication of it. Back to Mark's question. It seems to us that the end user, the consumer, is always going to be the cost causer in the scenario we described. And if I'm wrong about that and costs are imposed on the intermediate content provider, the likelihood is that we'll pass those costs back to the consumer in any event. So I think it's a false construct to suggest that we could somehow find somebody in the middle of the network and assess them as a way of solving a cost recovery problem, which I would say we disagree with. We don't agree that the problem exists. And the, the, there's a great <clears throat> historical lesson that we all went through in the 70s. And I think Larry, if you were here, and Bob was around, and we were trying to wring out implicit subsidies from the phone network, right? And it took this country, what, 25 years to try to do that? We're still doing that today. There was an, an order that came out of the FCC last year that attempted to solve this problem where long distance providers were contributing in an implicit way to cost recovery in the local access network. That's a model that nobody wants to repeat. And I would suggest that the best way is to push these charges to the end user, particularly when you have content providers like Netflix, Google, others, who are bringing their content closer to the end users and thereby, thereby causing ISPs to avoid the costs yeah, of reaching you, that content can, further. Can you talk a little bit just about that before we go on, which is you know, the kinds of investments that you said that you're now investing in CDNs, and that you're talking about investing and taking content closer and then caching. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because yeah. isn't that investment in 
uh, either transport or substitute for transport? I mean, how does that work? It does. It, so, and this is not just a Netflix specific point. Lots of right. companies are doing this. So I don't mean to suggest that we're the only one right. doing no, this. No, yeah. And that's good, right? Because Akamai and Limelight and others are out there trying to do this. It is a effort for us, a latency <coughs> insensitive application. We can take a movie or television show and move it closer to you at two in the morning, right, where there's less congestion and allow it to sit on a cache server which is local to the user, right? So it's in closer to the head end than it would be at an internet exchange point or, you know, and so- you pay for that to- And so we'll bear the costs and we'll actually donate the server appliances into the ISPs network, which again, allow them to avoid the costs of those direct facilities as well as the connections behind it. So it's a model that I think tries to alleviate some of the cost recovery problems that you're mentioning. I still think there's a disconnect on whether our side of the equation and your side agree that there's a cost recovery problem that needs fixing. Well, yeah, just a couple of points in response. Um, firstly, the, the subsidies that have been a problem that Christmas, Christopher mentions were caused by regulation. Um, and I think the cost causation question is an interesting question, but it ultimately can be a distraction. Because there's going to be no real answer to that. We'll go back and forth all day and ultimately conclude that you know, in competitive markets, companies decide how they're going to allocate the cost. My real concern with going down that road is it gives regulators an opportunity, in effect, to pick winners and losers without regard to the competitiveness of the markets. I think it goes to Sally's point about no permanent favorites. We don't want regulators picking permanent favorites either. If the market works, we should trust the market. And that doesn't mean negotiations will be easy. Commercial, commercial negotiations are never easy. But you can find an optimum outcome. The, the guiding star, in my view, should be when we find demonstrated and really sustainable market power in the market as it exists today, which is very different from the old telephone networks, that regulators need to become, become concerned. But unless an ISP were to disconnect from every network, and the content provider were to disconnect from every network, the bits are going to find their way through. That's how the networks work. The issue is clearly each company is going to have a preferred approach, and each company is going to bring that to a negotiating table to negotiate. So I just wanted to underscore again, the goal here is to maintain the, the, the incredible flexibility and innovation that we have today. I'm sure it's, it's readily evolvable, on a word or not, it's a great word. Um, and the commercial flexible framework gives us that. Now, as I say, it's not a world of no regulation. There may be public policy objectives we need to address. There may be universal service concerns we need to address both here and abroad. And there may be issues where you do find some sustainable market power. But until that's proven, given the track record over the last 15 years, we, we should really exercise some regulatory restraint and humility. Let me bring it back, if I could, uh, to start with, with Mark's excellent point. I, I think it is extraordinarily important uh, in these conversations and in others to focus not only on what's going on here, but also clearly what's going on in the developing world. You know, some of us are old enough to remember the Maitland Commission report, which talked about the fact uh, that it was only a few years ago that over half of the world did not, had never made a telephone call, had zero access to the telephone networks. That was an extraordinary thing. Uh, thanks to the ITU and by others around the world, that situation has changed dramatically. Uh, it's changed, as you pointed out, Mark, changed dramatically in terms of voice. But it's also, I think, changing even on broadband. One of the things I'm struck by is that so much of the conversation today has focused on wireline-related issues, which are very capital-intensive, very difficult. But yet, so much of the world has gone in terms of 3G to wireless broadband. And I'm struck, actually, the great rollout that's going on globally uh, on LTE. Uh, I used LTE on the train coming up uh, here this morning. And the speeds were every bit as fast as what I get at home. I mean, it was really quite extraordinary. And LTE, again, thanks to the ITUs being able to move uh, very quickly on spectrum-related issues, now we see this going on globally. I think there's actually the promise in the developing world, in some respects, on rapid broadband is even better than it is in certain areas of the developed world. Uh, Europe is actually having tremendous problems in, in trying to get the spectrum to rule that out. Um, on Sally's point about uh, untested, uh, I think that's something we, we all recognize. And I think it underscores, we often focus on the fact that there are great successes in the OTP space. Uh, but as any investor will tell you, there are many more failures than there are successes. Uh, and the question really is, not just picking on the few successes, as spectacular as they are, 
but also to recognize you need to have an enabling environment to allow for lots of failures because it's impossible to predict who the successes are going to be. And to David's point uh, about the continuous evolution, I think that's at the core of everything we've been talking about. The unpredictability of the next success story. That pace clearly has been building faster and faster over the past, as you pointed out, 30 years or so. It has no reason to believe that that pace is going to slow down. Therefore, the restrictions that regulations, whether domestic, international, or otherwise, that are almost always built upon existing business models should be taken with a great care because we'll lock in the past rather than to get the future. Thank you, David. I think um, uh, it's time to thank the panel. Uh, the Secretary General is here.